Perfect. We are live now on Facebook. Hello, everyone that is watching us, not only from Zoom, but also from Facebook and all the other social media platforms through the different programs here. My name is Felipe, and I am here with the Charter for Compassion to introduce you to two wonderful people that are participating on our um, in the Global Reprogram today. So first of all, uh, today we have the book, uh, Living Well with a Serious Illness, A Guide to Palliative Care for Mind, Body, and Spirit by Robin bennett Kenerick. We are so grateful to have you here with us. Thank you so much for that. And so uh, we have here our author and also the host, the person that will be directing this conversation, Dr. Christina Buchalski. Thank you so much also for being here. Um, at the end of this conversation, I'm going to take over just for a little bit to let you know about the different activities that are happening with the Charter for Compassion. But as of now, we welcome both uh, Dr. Puchalski and the author Robin bennett Kenerick to our global read. So let me just stop sharing screen here and we'll get to it. All right, all yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that lovely introduction, Felipe. So it's my pleasure to be um, on this webinar with my friend, Robin Kanarek, um, and author of the book, Here's My Copy. Um, really, really excellent book, and I've been sharing it with lots of people. Highly recommend it. Just a little bit about how we met. I've been, I started an institute on spirituality and health at the beginning of the century in 2001, uh, based on some work we started on education of physicians in, um, in how to address spirituality and health, spiritual health um, in their care, which is very novel at that time. Um, though not novel in history, because many over many years in history, the, the notion of spiritual health was really important. And over these last many years, I've been involved in developing guidelines and then a uh, education training program called Interprofessional Spiritual Care Education Curriculum to help educate clinicians in how they can integrate spiritual health in their practice and specifically identify spiritual distress. And then how we work with spiritual care experts such as board certified chaplains. And we are currently working on a global initiative on how to advance that interprofessional spiritual care. So in that context, I was invited to give a presentation at Fairfield um, in Connecticut. And I had a chance to meet Robin. I gave a talk and Robin was, the first person to ask a question. And I just was incredibly inspired and impressed that it was about, um, about spiritual distress and her understanding of it. So Robin, I'd love for you to talk about that aha moment and, uh, and how that impacted you. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, do you want me to start with just telling a little bit about David, what happened? Yeah, so you so at the you know at the meeting, what you did, Robin, which was very powerful, is you you got up and and talked about about David and and your sort of how did you come to that aha moment about spiritual distress? Okay, um, my son was diagnosed. My ten year old son was diagnosed with uh, leukemia in 1995, and he was in full remission for four years, and um, and he had a two year protocol of chemo. And uh, in the fourth year, he relapsed, and we could not find a perfect match for a bone marrow transplant, and he was just too weak to endure another two years of chemotherapy. So he had a stem cell transplant, which was state-of-the-art at that point. This is in the year 2000. David was 15 years old. And um, he had the stem cell transplant. And in order to do that, you have to wipe out the uh, immune system and it has to grow back with uh, the new stem cells that are introduced, which were our daughters. And after he had his stem cells um, introduced, he, um, he had to go into strict isolation. And uh, he was going to be there for 28 days. And, um, and this is when I started experiencing something that Dr. Pukowski brought up that was just so unbelievable. When um, David was one week into his transplant, um, very few people were entering his room because they had a gown up and it was a very complex um, way to enter the room and you had to be very careful not to get him sick. And all of a sudden I noticed his personality changed. 
And um, he started getting very angry and belligerent and confrontational, not only with the nurses and doctors, but with my husband and I. And this was totally atypical for David. And he was such an easygoing young man. And so um, after the course of a couple of hours of seeing this, I was going to the doctors and nurses saying, what is going on here? Why is he changing like this? What's going on? And he, and they kept saying, we see this all the time in children who have transplants. And this is very normal, but that really didn't answer my question. Um, fast forward, um, Dr. Pukowski was at Fairfield University, which is the nursing school that I had attended. And uh, she is explaining what spiritual distress is for an adult. And she's saying people get angry, belligerent, depressed, um, lack of appetite, poor sleeping. And I couldn't believe it. That was exactly what David went through. So I said, I cannot believe this. This is exactly what my 15 year old son went through when he had a stem cell transplant. And I just couldn't believe it, it was like an aha moment to me for 20 years, I had absolutely no idea what was the cause of his sadness. And Dr. Pukowski described it to me and I just couldn't believe it, it was right on target. And since that time, it really has changed me in the sense that I started getting involved in spiritual support at the local hospital, because I, I have seen some miraculous things happen when you address the spiritual needs of a patient. So I am so grateful for what Dr. Pukowski did. And I think what you're talking about, Robin, it, yes, you're right. It was mostly for adults in my, in my presentation, but since then, in part, thanks to your generous um, grant and in our collaboration, we have developed a pediatric um, interprofessional spiritual care education. And indeed, there is a lot of literature on spiritual or existential distress across all ages. And it's so important and very apropos for talking about this uh, with the Charter on Compassion, because people will often say, how do I treat that? And you listed some of those things that it can be existential. Why is this happening to me? I think in the case of your son, it was a recognition that maybe he wouldn't live to adulthood. And that sense of, you know, um, devastation. So it can be despair, hopelessness. It can be you know, religious specific, maybe questioning about faith or other, you know, aspects. And, and what you said perfectly about the depression, often spiritual distress can overlap with depression. And if you try to treat spiritual distress with antidepressants, when people don't have depression, that's not the way to do it. And this is where, you know, referral to spiritual care professionals, such as chaplains, but us as clinicians to continue to be present. So you know, here we're speaking with an organization that is about compassion. What is that compassionate presence? How can we be present and listen? Because we can't often fix spiritual distress. You know, unlike depression, which maybe medications might help, spiritual distress is something that with our accompaniment, people get better. So that was, uh, I mean, you and I talked about that a, a lot, I think, in terms of your son and you know, that retrospectively looking back at what was going on. And I, I think I recall you saying they were thinking maybe it was depression, maybe not. And to find out that the one comment you made, which really struck me when you asked that question was what would have happened if the nurse had done like the FICA spiritual history tool that I developed Absolutely. or if a doctor had done that, right? What would that have been for you, your husband, your daughter and your son at that time, not to, you know, obviously for your son. So maybe you can say a little bit about where that comment came from. Well, you also have to remember that this was in 2000 and um, palliative care didn't become a recognized subspecialty until 2006. So we did not have palliative care available to us at that point. And, um, and so I don't know why, but we didn't have access to social workers, psychologists, um, and so it was just like 
his case was so complicated that everyone was just focusing on the medical and they weren't um they, they weren't focusing on his psychosocial and spiritual needs. And that's where I, I just realized that that is such a disservice that if you don't incorporate all these aspects of care, um, you're not doing the right service to the patient. The one thing I do want to say is after when David was in the spiritual distress, which I didn't know at the time. I, I was trying to get a psychiatrist to go in to talk to him, and the psychiatrist was not helping him. He was asking David questions about his relationship with me, and David eventually fired the doctor because the doctor wasn't helping him. And so then I went to his favorite doctor, his transplant doctor, and they had a wonderful rapport. And I literally had to plead with him to go in to have this conversation with David. Cause I almost, I sensed in my gut that David was, had fears of dying and, um, and, and questions about his own mortality. And the doctor I could see was very uncomfortable with this, but I, I didn't give him a choice. I said, you have to do this for David. And he went in and he spent three hours with David I have no idea what they discussed, but when the doctor came out, David was, um, the doctor said, your, your son had a lot of philosophical questions and the doctor was exhausted from the conversation and he left. And so my husband, Joe, and I looked at each other afterwards and we gowned up and went into David's room and we were expecting to see a very depressed young boy um in his bed and shockingly it was just the opposite he was smiling it was as though this burden had been lifted from him and i saw it and if i had not seen it i would never have believed it but i am so grateful that he had that conversation because he died seven months later from complications from the transplant and i am very very grateful that that happened um, but I am on a mission right now that people need to learn about what palliative care is, that it is not end of life. Um, palliative care is a part of hospice, but palliative care comes much earlier than hospice care, which is end of life care. And palliative care, I want the audience to be aware that palliative care can be provided with curative treatment. And because many people live with serious illnesses or multiple chronic conditions for many, many years. So you want to focus on their quality of life and, um, and, and symptom relief. Yeah. Yeah. So as you know, I am a palliative care physician. I also um, direct a very small hospice in, in, in DC. And that is exactly such a good point because the first question many patients will ask me is palliative care that means I'm dying and no. and really the goal is early on I mean really early on and I've had many patients who say are diagnosed with cancer I I even start seeing them right at diagnosis and maybe the chemotherapy works and they move on and then you know seven years later or ten years later they may be back and they come see me again in conjunction with the oncologist and, and that is what's so critical and why I love this book, because I think it's written in a way that um, shows the beauty, the whole person aspect of palliative care. In fact, um, palliative care, I've always felt this way, is, is a good model of care in general. It's the oh. whole person, right? Physical, holistic. emotional, spiritual, spiritual, holistic. And, and it's the way that we really should practice all of medicine. But palliative care specialists, such as myself, are trained more in pain management, symptom management, communication, and things like presence. You know, I think that's important. The story, I was so touched by that story of the doctor. I don't think you told me that before. Spending three hours, three hours. Three hours. And, and what a gift that was to your son and, and to him, I, I would venture to say to the doctor as well. I, I can't imagine this, you, you can't, how he cannot be changed by it because it was so profound. Um, and the, I, it was just mind blowing to me and how it, 
really impacted David mentally. And that's what I, I just wished um, I had these answers earlier. Um, but because I could, I didn't have the answers until I heard you speak, um, I really decided after David passed away, we moved to London. And I just needed to get away from, if I was going east, I was going to Yale University. If I was going west, I was going into New York City, into Sloan Kettering. And I just felt after he died, we needed a new beginning. And our daughter certainly needed a new beginning because she was five years old when he was diagnosed. And so she had lived in the shadow of his illness for all, for all that time. So we needed a new beginning for her too. So we moved to London and I focused two years on grieving. And then once I, I went through that, I got involved with an organization that I had been reading about in, in the UK called the Teenage Cancer Trust, which was building teen, teenage cancer units for teenagers and young adults. And that concept hadn't been introduced into the US. And I was just really so incredibly moved by what they were doing. So I asked to volunteer and I, got involved with them and we met monthly and I wanted to educate other parents on that first month after a diagnosis is so traumatic and how you have to be very easy on yourself during that period of time because so much information is being thrown at you and you can only take in so much information at a time. And so it was just an amazing experience to be able to um, to be surrounded by healthcare providers who were interested in helping us, but but the next step was to to educate healthcare professionals and patients on palliative care. So I started getting involved with the Teenage Cancer Trust. They were passionate about their work. I started writing articles, and then all of a sudden, I started writing into medical journals and nursing journals because I wanted to share what I had learned with other healthcare providers. Um, I felt safe in that environment and people responded very positively. But then um, in 2017, our foundation, the Canaric Family Foundation, funded the building of a palliative care center for nursing ed education at Fairfield University. And, um, and that's when things started really happening. I really wanted to educate nurses, social workers, um, chaplains. And soon as the program was up and running, I thought, okay, now we're educating healthcare providers, but who's going to educate the consumer? And I did a literature search and there was no information. There was not one book on palliative care a whole book, all the books that I had read on palliative care were geared for nurses and doctors and social workers. Um, so there really was a void. And so I felt I have to do this. And I wanted to do it in David's memory. And because this is his legacy, he only lived to 15. So I want this to be his legacy. And so um, this is my gift to him and also my gift to the consumer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. I see some comments and um, one comment from Dr. Stephanie Palmeno. When I oh, first heard, Stephanie's uh, a good friend. Hi, Steph. <laughs> she graduated in 1969 from nursing um, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and she can think of uh, many of her patients who went through this. Um, and she just talked about how being young and inexperienced, but that work uh, forever impacted her vision and practice of nursing, beautifully put. And it sounds like that's a, what happened to you. Yeah. Oh, and Stephanie's very involved with the, um, the Coalition for Compassion, and she is a dynamo and a heart of gold. Mm -hmm. And um, so she is phenomenal. And I think she continues to say that, um, we spend many more time considering the impact of early childhood trauma on children who have grown into adults and may be experiencing problems, but I've um, not often, if ever, seen the trauma of serious illness or prolonged illness as being part of that inquiry. 
Does anyone have any experience with that? That's interesting about the impact of early childhood trauma on children that've grown into adults. And then uh, does anyone have any experience with that? And I, I can tell in my own experience with adults and I, you know, I do palliative care. I also do internal medicine and geriatrics. So I see a, a wide range. Um, and I, you know, I, I take, I do take care of some special needs, young adults who finish with children's hospital at age 18 and have come to me. So I do see that in fact, I'm really impressed with how young uh, children somehow manage to overcome that and, and accept what's going on with them. But, but, um, but I have seen some trauma leading, you know, from people who have suffered a lot of of chronic illness through their life. Robin, I don't know if you have any experiences in that regard. I, when, I was, when I was in London, at, um, I, I befriended um, a nurse counselor. Um, she dealt with teenagers who were, had, um, who were dying and who had relapsed many times. And one of the issues that was very difficult for her um, but she dealt with it beautifully, was there were several um, patients, um, and this was videotaped um, on the BBC. Um, there were teenagers who had relapsed four or five times, and they were 16, 17 years old. And the parents just wanted everything done for the teenager. And the teenager said, you know what, I've had enough. I'm exhausted. I can't do this anymore. And so, and in the UK, um, you, a, a teenager has, can make their own choice at the age of 16. So um, these teenagers were able to make their own decisions, but in the US it's 18, 17, 18. And Art Kaplan, who's a famous ethicist at um, NYU, um, posted um, a fabulous post on social media last week. And it was about a teenage girl who was had relapsed and they the family wanted her to do some experimental treatment. And she says, I've had enough. I, I don't want to do this anymore. And so he posed the question to the audience as to what do you think? And I wrote and I said, um, I said, absolutely. I mean, you know, kids who, who go through this are very mature and they've been through, they have, they are going through an experience that most of us experience much later in life. And they are very resilient and they cope. And, um, but I have to say, it is very, very tough to watch. Um, and I saw it with my son when he relapsed. I mean, he said, why is this happening to me? What did I do wrong? And so it, it's, and then our daughter, who on the other hand was 10 when he relapsed and died. And she, um, she had her own way of coping. And I, I think it, it haunts her. I really do think it haunts her. I, I, how can you not, how can this not affect you? I think people, and this is where spirituality and health or spiritual health sort of comes into, into being, you know, we, we have those, you know, artificial, but four domains, physical, emotional, you know, social and spiritual. And I think in our culture, we know that for physical, we, you know, it's an ongoing process. We work on that all our life, hopefully, you know, same with, you know, intellectual, emotional, social, but we don't often think of that in, in terms of spirituality and what I've seen in my, and spiritual development. And, you know, what I've seen in my practice is that there are some people who really um, have that uh, sort of um, reflective aspect in their life. So as they go through things, you know, and, and for some people, and, and this isn't meant to be a judgment, it's just that we're all different. And it can, we can be also within ourselves. So sometimes in my life, during my life, when I was younger, it was harder to move through some difficult things. It's different now. So it's, it's, it, it's a lot of time, what I've seen is when people have a chance to explore their spiritual, however they understand Absolutely. that, does not necessarily need to be religion. It's broadly defined as searching for meaning, purpose, and a sense of transcendence, whatever that is for people, and a relationship with a wide variety of things. And that meaning and purpose, living out of a life of meaning and purpose, if people can get into that, they can often come to some terms and understandings about their own suffering that they've experienced 
or the Absolutely. loss of their brother or their loss of a family member or a colleague of mine who's, you know, both parents died when she was young. You know, how, how we come to take what life has offered us, so to speak, and, and come to a deeper understanding and, you know, shift that into some perhaps action or motivation. I mean, I, this is an example right here in this book. I mean, this, this was difficult for you to lose your son and to go through that experience. And I think, you know, as, as the many years that I've known you now, I think that has in some ways ignited that passion for you around palliative care and making sure that people have all of those four domains of care addressed. That's why I said. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think I also have to say that before David's death, I was not necessarily a spiritual person. I was raised in a fairly religious home, but as I got older, religion took more of a backside in my, um, in my life. But after he died, I started reading all of Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's books uh, on death and dying. And she had a book on children who die, who, who, who are dying. And I have to say it, it spoke to me and it changed me. And I started reading more and more books on spirituality. And I found that it really fueled me. And then I started reading a book by Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. And that book turned me around and made me say, okay, I don't have control over what happened with David's health and his death, but I have control as to how I'm going to deal with this. Mm -hmm. And I had a daughter I had who to, to really mother because prior when she, when David was sick, I really didn't have the time to spend with her. Um, so I just felt that I really needed to focus on what I could do in his memory. And that, and the more I started doing and the, the people I've connected with, like you, Christina, or from Eileen O'Shea from Fairfield University, who's the director of the Canaric Center, we talk all the time about ideas and what's needed. And every time I talk about this, I get energized. And sometimes I'm even saying this is kind of morbid, but when I talk about what I'm doing and what I'm learning, I feel David with me. I mean, I feel his presence with me all the time. And the first 15 years after he died, I dreamt about him regularly. I don't now, but I have to tell you, he's still a very much a part of my life. And each project that I do validates how he is with me and how I'm going to honor his legacy. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you, Robin. Um, a question about a professional spiritual care. And I know board certified healthcare chaplains now are much more common than they probably were when uh, your son was in the hospital. But did you at all experience any kind of professional spiritual care, be it through a chaplain or maybe clergy? You mean when David was ill? Yeah. Yes. No. None. None whatsoever. And um, there is uh, a rabbi at the hospital that I do the spiritual support who's palliative, who's certified in palliative care. And she has taught me, you taught me the, uh, the, uh, the, the clinical, uh, the, the, the general, what I needed to know about palliative yeah. care, but she taught me the clinical and showed, demonstrated to me how it can have an impact on a patient if they're going through spiritual distress. And I have seen patients in the ICU um, who are confused and angry and acting out. And I'll go into their room and I'll whisper to them. And I said, would you like me to say a prayer for you? Would you like me? And they all wake up and they say, yes, please say a, a prayer for me. And I have to tell you, it has changed me. And I, if, if there are any nursing professors on this uh, Zoom webinar, I have to tell you, that's the one thing I wished I learned was the spiritual element of care, because mm -hmm. it is so profound. It's something so simple, but it can have a major impact, not only on the patient, but the family. Exactly. And I think what you, I, it sounded like you were going to talk about this, but the, the model is like a generalist specialist model. So yes. you and I 
social workers, others, we're the generalist spiritual care professionals. And ideally we can partner with, if it happens to be, you were talking about prayer, if it happens to be a religious person who's got a, um, a close relationship with a faith community leader, maybe that's the person that would help that person. But in hospital settings, board certified healthcare chaplains, they go through training, they work with anyone, whether they're religious or not. Uh, usually my one of my colleagues who works with me when he first started, he's a chaplain at GW, they said, oh, there's you know God talk going on in room 302, we need a chaplain. But it's not just about God talk, right? It's it's they're really trained in counseling and in listening to spiritual themes and being present with the patient and so that collaborative approach is what we're working on in our initiative how do we as nurse and doctor social worker how do we work collaboratively with the chaplain so the chaplain would see the patient but tell us how we continue to do it so it's so important that all clinicians on this call know that you know, we want the clinicians to do a spiritual screening or spiritual history, depending on what your role is, that you're present to a patient in the middle of their, in the midst of their suffering, and that, that, they're, that bringing in a trained healthcare chaplain can really help. So yeah, that wasn't present when David was in the hospital, but over all these years that has changed and there's more and more healthcare chaplains in hospital settings. And if I had my way, every hospital would be fully staffed with healthcare chaplains as well as even outpatient clinics. Oh, I, 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 I cannot tell you the difference it makes when someone, uh, when a chaplain does this, who's especially if they're trained in, um, in palliative care, it, it makes a huge difference, huge, huge difference. Yeah. 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 You know, one other thing, and it relates to a comment I'm kind of seeing in, on, on the side here, um, I, I, the way you describe going to England, and that was your time of bereavement or time of grief. This is such a critical area, and it is so neglected about grief. When I was in medical school way back, they talked about, well, grief lasts about three months. And if it's longer than that, then it's, you know, pathology. That is not true. You know, I think the best the best um, definition I got from, from a colleague was, well, it's really, you know, first six months are really hard. One year still is hard, a little bit better. And with each year, with each year, but he says, give yourself about five years before you fully integrate. And so I, I loved what you had to say. And there, I, maybe, it, maybe it went up, but it, there was a question. Um, there, there it is. So Marianne Bose says, thank you, Robin. I agree with everything. As my son, Deva, had a similar experience as David, died in the intensive care unit at 14. Wow, Marianne. Um, with the only conversation being, what's the next surgery? I appreciate that you are working to educate both the consumer and the health professionals. I'm curious about the process of your first two years of grieving and also how your daughter's grief was processed and supported. Thank you. And then she notes, I believe that she's finally processing her grief 50 years later. It's, and I agree with this statement, it is never too late. And yet how wonderful it would have been if communities could have received our stories in that way, listening, contributing to the healing. So what, how were you processing your grief and then that of your helping your daughter or being part of your daughter's and husband's? Uh, before we moved, I remember I was watching a movie um, with Sarah. Um, this is after David died. And it was something about a, a child dying. Mm -hmm. And I started to ball like a baby. And Sarah started, she was 10 years old and she was consoling me. And I have a feeling that she felt this sense of responsibility to be strong for me. And when we moved to London, I mean, you've got to remember, we moved in the middle of the school year. She had to make new friends, new community. So it was real. I mean, she was going through a lot. And she and David were very, very close. Um, but those first two years, I was on an emotional roller coaster, and so was Joe. And I just felt I needed to focus on myself, and I had to focus on Sarah. And so I just felt the, the natural thing was to just go into grief counseling. And I found a fabulous therapist who is not far away from where I lived. I saw her twice a week. And, but I did, I was really a wreck. I mean, those first two years, I was crying uncontrollably um my my 
my husband. I was lashing out at him. And finally, I had to say, this is not directed towards you. This is my own confusion. I, I don't understand why this happened. And you know, you're processing all this. But it wasn't until I really started meeting other parents who had lost children at the Teenage Cancer Trust um, that I realized that I wasn't alone. Because when you're going through this, you are in your own little world. And, um, and there are not many people that you really can share um, the devastation that you're going through because emotionally it's, it's very, very draining. So I only chose specific people to share with. But as time went by, I started getting involved in, in groups in London and I started sharing more with it. And as I shared it, people, they surprised me and they made a donation to a project that I was working on at our lo at local hospital in Connecticut that I want, my first project in David's memory is I wanted to build um, a toy closet at a pediatric unit at the hospital I used to work at. And this group that I was involved with in London made a very significant donation to honor David and to honor the work that I was doing. So I, I mean, people, people are so kind and so generous and, and so, so want so much to help, but many times people don't know how to help. And the one thing I want to convey is just what you said, Christina, the art of listening. Um, and I have suggested this to several people who deal with families who've lost children. And they say, what do I say? What do I do? And I said, listen, you can't fix anything. All you can do is allow the parents to vent. And the biggest suggestion I have is to keep your mouth closed. Don't say anything, just listen. Because sometimes I have found, even with the patients I'm dealing with now, if you allow silence to happen, there's that discomfort over silence. And usually someone will start a, start a conversation. And many times I have found, and I've been in the receiving end, where someone was talking to me about David and they were just silent and I started blurbing things out and that was enough to get the conversation going. So I have to say silence is, is really, really important and not to give any advice, just listen. And many times when I go into a patient's room, when I do the spiritual support, I kind of ground myself before I go in, I have to kind of take a deep breath in. And this is what the rabbi taught me. I need to take a deep breath in and just give my undivided attention to that patient. And it really works. It really works. But you have to be taught how to do all this. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important. There's a question here. Is palliative care for any chronic illness or is it for serious chronic illnesses that will likely end with death? Oh, well, a lot of chronic illnesses like diabetes and heart disease and, and kidney disease, I mean, they can be controlled to a degree. And so, but when you start having all three of those and having multiple chronic conditions, that's when you're at a higher risk for developing complications. So I think, um, a serious illness includes multiple chronic conditions. And um, so if you have diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, lung disease, you're at a higher risk for other problems. And so that's where palliative care can really help. And, um, and you can live with, with a serious illness for many years. And research has shown that many people who feel really supported emotionally and physically, um, can live longer because they, they're not as stressed they, and, they, and they're not as fearful. Fear of the unknown is the most awful thing. Right, right. Usually within hospital settings, palliative care, um, you know, also just for practical reasons too, but it is serious and or chronic illness that somebody came in with an exacerbation of their chronic illness. So palliative care is not, not just with the eye of you know, end of life care, but it can be that a person with chronic illness is experiencing severe pain, 
or yes. other types of symptoms or spiritual distress or other symptoms and palliative care is often involved with that. Um, and I think, you know, I do outpatient palliative care and I do have a lot of patients with chronic illness. So it doesn't have to be only, you know, immediately or end of life in the, in the near future. It is about managing symptoms, helping people improve their, the focus on quality of life. Um, it, it's very, very, especially important around times of uh, difficult decision making. So for both the patient and the family, because palliative care also will work with the family. So say a family member deciding, should I do this treatment? Should I not do this treatment? I'm getting tired of my chronic illness. Now, now I'm being faced with, you know, a potential surgery, but should I do it or should I not? Those difficult kinds of uh, decisions, if, if you have a good palliative care team in the hospital, um, that includes not only the physician and the nurse, but also a chaplain and a social worker and others to, to be able to work with both the family and the, the patient around what are next steps, what are potential options. I think that's really important. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the other thing I want to emphasize that I wrote the book. Um, I mean, it, it really is for me to honor David, but also it's everything that I've learned from the time David was ill, um, from um, who, who palliative care is appropriate for, um, barriers to the, to how palliative, barriers for palliative care and what we can do to change things. Um, and I personally feel it's nurses who are gonna lead the way in palliative care. Um, I, nurses have just a, a, a more holistic way of approach of, of patient care and nurses just look at the whole picture where doctors tend to look in their silo and they're in their own specialty. And so the nurse just has, has, has a gift for this. And I, when I go to nursing schools and I, I, share my story, there's always one or two nursing students who I can see their eyes open up and how they're, they're hungry for this information. So those are the people that you really want to connect with. And, um, and I also emphasize in the book, leading research. Um, and I, 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 doc, I document all the, the top people in the field, including Dr. Kulski, um, there's Steve Pantelot, Betty Farrell, um, then you've got Diane Meyer from CAPSI. I mean, there's so many phenomenal people. And Atul Gawande, who wrote Being Mortal, his book, literally, when it was written in 2014, his book really was the, to me, it was like a sign saying, okay, palliative care is the answer and we need to promote this. And so his book changed me also and, and gave me, was the impetus for me to make the donation for a palliative care nursing education program at Fairfield University. Yeah, there is a great commitment to palliative care. Um, and I think it's really, really important. There's a, a good comment here. I live in a major city of 2 million people with a medical school. What you encountered over 20 years ago without social work or accompaniment, genuine palliative care is still true here today. Yeah. Mm. And that's another topic. You know, we are getting more of a corporatization of, of medicine and healthcare, and it's, it's devastating. So we need, palli we need palliative care for the field of healthcare, but we, we really need to really go back to our roots we need to go back to our roots. And I think that's part of what you're experiencing over there. Um, I've been abandoned by spiritual community, medical and social service system and continue to experience trauma and isolation after the onset of CRPS, RSD that quickly progressed to severe. I'm so, sorry, to, oh. sorry to hear that. So sorry to hear that. Was written off summarily by generic palliative care who outsourced by clergy, by anyone re-spiritual or any other accompaniment. Um, the EMS would show up, hospital stated, could do nothing more, traumatized. What I've been through and am still experiencing is simple psych pathology, and even medical professionals were not equipped to motivate or deal with any aspect of disease. Not with, there was no compassion, iatrogenic and exacerbated disease and isolation. And the last sentence, yes, genuine palliative care is so needed, such a dearth of it in the reality of practice. 
Absolutely. I think what's going on in our healthcare system, and sadly, people may not know this, but the suicide rate of physicians is over twice that of the national average. And I hear of colleagues, unfortunately, committing suicide. And part of that is exacerbated by COVID, but part of it now by the the real corporatization of, of healthcare, which I think is is something we need to advocate um, to move in a better direction to, because we need to honor the person, you know, that everyone should be treated. And that's what you're saying here, you know, moving perhaps from one source to another, but not having that place, that provider, be it the nurse or the physician or chaplain that could have helped you. And yes, genuine palliative care is needed because palliative care specialists are trained in these areas. Uh, palliative care social workers, nurses, doctors, et cetera. And there is now a specialty for chaplains to be palliative care certified, to be able to walk with Carolyn, with people who've had your experience. And I think that's why this book is so important because it's really written with the idea, you know, not so much for the professionals that we could benefit from it, but for everybody. And you have a right to advocate and say, I need palliative care. The majority of hospitals, I don't know the exact number, but there will be some palliative care presence. And, you know, when you're in, when anyone is stuck in a situation like that, um, I just ask to see the palliative care team. And I do that for my patients when they're in other hospitals that I don't have privileges in, ask for palliative care, ask for palliative care uh, under any circumstance. And as with Diane Meyer, who was the who is the head of um, the Center to Advance Palliative Care in New York City, and she was she's out of Mount Sinai, she literally says, you may have to demand it. Yeah. And I was just on a, a radio show with um, Diana Mason, who mm -hmm. is a nursing policy um, professor, and she teaches at George Washington University, and she taught at Hunter, and she has this program and she lost her husband in December and she talks, talked about it on um, her talk show. He had a massive stroke. He had a, um, his father and grandfather both died very early of a stroke. He was 80 and he had a massive stroke. And he told Diana, I don't want extraordinary measures done. Um, and so she went to the neurosurgeon and she says, why don't we start palliative care? And this is in the Catskills somewhere. I don't know what hospital. And the doctor said to her, we're not there yet. So he was already, he con was confusing palliative care with end of life. And so she finally pushed and pushed and pushed. And she's, she's a pretty dynamic woman. And she finally was able to get it, but she said she had to demand it. Mm -hmm. And so this is where you need to have a plan um, with your family as to what you really want. And, um, and yeah. so it's just very, very, um, I, I cannot emphasize how important that is, that you have to speak up for yourself or for your loved one. And yeah. it's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. But you have to do it. Yeah. And that that's been true for a while. You know, I know when my when I was taking care of my dad, when he moved out here, I, I had to be his spokesperson because things can, you know, people are busy and they try to, you know, move people through fairly quickly and you need an advocate at any level. And I, I see a comment about um, in Minnesota, you can only receive palliative care if you're in the hospital. And Mayo Health, by the way, has excellent palliative care team. But yes, that's the case in many places. Uh, I think the outpatient palliative care is relatively new in different states. I know New York has one. Um, I believe you know other states do. But it is primarily first in the hospital. But many of us are doing it in the outpatient settings. And in those outpatient settings, it's usually in cancer clinics though it's again moving. So ALS, people with ALS, ALS clinics, there's a presence in our organization at George Washington University, the Medical Faculty Associates presence, uh, you know, across care uh, for, for palliative care. I'm, I have a supportive and palliative care clinic in oncology in the outpatient setting. So we are hoping absolutely that we have palliative, that, that there'll be more palliative care in outpatient long-term care, absolutely long-term care as well, yes. And then if you're in a hospital that doesn't offer palliative care, 
I would speak to someone in administration um, or send them an email and saying, this is something you really need to do. And I served on the, on the board of trustees of a local hospital. And as a board member, I really pushed for it. And now they have an outpatient palliative care program starting and there's another one. I mean, so it's starting, it's starting. But um, I think as a consumer, you really need to let your hospital know that this is needed. And, um, and, and if you push hard enough, they're gonna hear you. They'll, yeah. They will hear you. Yeah. yeah. If you look up um, uh, on the NCP guidelines on palliative care, if you're interested, they, um, they list all of the domains of palliative care. So it is the classic physical, emotional, et cetera, but domain five is spiritual. And again, that can be broadly defined or religious, however the person is presenting that for themselves. And, um, and, and again, the wonderful chaplains that are working on palliative care teams, but also the healthcare professionals, the team also is addressing, or should be addressing, we're beginning to see more and more of that happening from our work and others. Um, the spiritual domain and what gives meaning and purpose. And, and ultimately that's that, that sense of, you know, we, when we go, all these messages that I'm seeing and I so relate to them is that many of us go into the hospital setting and then it's like a whirlwind, you know, you're running through the emergency room and you don't quite know what's going on with your loved one or if you're the patient. And what I see as palliative care is like a breath of fresh air. It's let's take a moment and first let's see what's happening here and then move forward. And I, I, I think it's just such, I wish, again, I think it's a great way to practice care in general, but um, would love to see more palliative care settings in hospitals and would encourage anyone, if you're in a hospital, to ask for a palliative care referral. If you're at that point, we're getting lots of different, you know, do you can do this for your loved one, you can do this, you can do that. Just taking that moment to, with a palliative care team who will take the time to listen to everything that's involved in the conversation and yes, moving more into the outpatient setting is critical. I'd also like to mention um, that the Center to Advance Palliative Care in New York City has a website called getpalliativecare.org. And if you go to that website, you can put in your town and they will show you um, the nearest palliative care site um, and palliative care professionals that you can connect with. Um, so that is something, getpalliativecare.org is a fabulous site. And, and also the Association of America, uh, the AAHPM Hospice and Palliative Medicine that uh, does a joint conversation um, um, conference with the, uh, the equivalent Nursing Palliative Care Association. They also have good websites and uh, there are many, many palliative care organizations now and, and hospice and HP hospice and palliative care organizations that you can also get information on. And then I see the getpalliativecare.org. Yes, excellent. Yep. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I'd also like to just say that I do have a website. It's very easy, robincaneric.com. And that's everything in re that revolves around, and it's, it's brand new and it's all revolving around the book and, um, and, lectures and all every all the radio this will be on it um this interview so uh please check that out robincaneric.com yeah that's fantastic and also robin's been very involved with us at gwish so if you're interested in the work here it's uh, gwish.org gwish.org and you'll get a chance to see uh, how, you know, a lot of the different things that we're doing we're also beginning to work with mental health professionals in this area so so important in uh, in palliative care. And my hope, you know, we we funded um, with GWISH um, the implementation of a pediatric um, the uh, Inter I spec pediatrics. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you. And um, it was it was just when I met Christina, I was asking what has the research shown on pediatric spirituality, and she said there's nothing. There's nothing been documented. So that's why I really felt I needed to do this um, because I just, and I met another friend who lost a child at the age of five and she, her child went through spiritual distress also. And she didn't know what it was. She thought her child was angry at her. And when I told her what was, what 
I had learned, she started to cry. She says, oh, I thought it was my fault. And, you know, I, I so mm -hmm. I, I cannot thank you enough, Christina, for the work you've done. It has opened up my eyes to a whole area of care that I never would have known about. And I and just I want to, to, yes, I'm sorry. I want to clarify there. There was a lot of research in palliative care, pediatric palliative care, but in this area of spirituality, spirituality and, and, you know, trying to understand it and so much has changed. So much has changed. There's a wonderful organization, the Maruzza Foundation in Italy that does an annual conference on pediatric palliative care, which I was privileged to be part of, even I don't do pediatrics and so many powerful stories about how you know the importance of palliative care number one in children, but also in 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 the spiritual needs of children. That yes, they do have needs, and and um, and faith development, spiritual development is a huge part with children, and to understand where they are at each stage and how to approach them that way. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Thank you, Robin, for that. It's, the partnership continues to be wonderful, so I appreciate that. We have um, we have just a couple, like one more minute, and then I'm going to turn this over to the team here. But are there any other questions or anything people want to ask before we, we pass this on to, to Lynn and Felipe? I have to thank the Charter for Compassion for all the incredible work that they have done. I have um, become aware of the work they have done through Dr. Palmino, who, um, who asked the first question. Um, I have to say, bringing compassion back into our workplace, in hospitals, in business, in all facets of life is so important. I, I think we all need to realize how important compassion is. And yeah. that, that validates our humanness. Yeah. Um, that's right. I mean, and that's we you know, on this online curriculum. So the iSpec curriculum is online level one. And then we do a train the trainer. We work with institutions as well, but our module three is all on compassionate presence because that is such a key piece. You know, our, our role as a, a, a colleague of mine, his, his um, mentor, uh, who is a missionary, she had said, our role um, is to stand in the face of massive suffering and not run away. And that is, wow. yeah, that is, that is our, that is really our role and palliative care. I, I think we're trained at least a little bit in that way to not run away, that we are okay with difficult conversations. We're okay with tears. We're okay with uncertainty. We don't need to make you certain. We're okay in being in present. And I think that's what's so, so critical about this field and so critical about this book of living well with a, well with a serious illness is that it is something you can share and help people to advocate for, ask for it, and know that they're not alone. And exactly, genuine presence is key. It's not turning away. And I think if we don't lose that, we'll be able to navigate these rough waters right now of corporatization and move it into a way that we can bring back some of the values of what we need in our service profession. So I just want to thank you, Robin, for, oh. for our friendship, number one, for, for your supporting our work and helping, helping us address kids in this work, which is so children, which is so important, adolescents, young adults, and for this book, which is wonderful. I have shared this with many people. People, I recommend that everybody get this book and share it. It's, it is easy to understand and it really gets to the root of palliative care. So thank you so much, Robin. My pleasure. And thank you, Charter for Compassion, for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for your great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your incredible conversation. I feel like if there's a takeaway for me is one, we don't know anything when it comes to, you know, spirituality and things like that. If we, if, if we think that if we don't see it, touch it, hear it, or smell it, it doesn't exist. And this whole field of spirituality with palliative care is just a, such an eye opener to understand that there's so much more, so much more depth within us and around us. So oh. thank you for that so much for that and for the application of compassion to the system. And, and honestly, Robin, thank you for taking a tragedy and make it uh, something that other people that are experiencing or will experience something similar to you to have tools, to have answers, to, to, you know, be able to answer the questions that you are unable to in your moment. So very, very grateful for, 
everything that you have presented. And thank you, Dr. Kuchowski, for the amazing questions and the way that you directed this. This has been amazing. Um, I just wanted to close really quickly with what we have so far for next time in, in the charter. So tomorrow we have um, our Ednet Forum with Linda Cruz and Race for Good. That is at 7.30 Pacific time tomorrow. You're welcome to attend. Um, then we have Cultivating Compassion. The uh, session seven is Thursday, July 27th, so next th Thursday with the book, The Wild Age of Sorrow by Francis Weller. All this are open for you to register. We have our charter Sangha next Thursday, July, I mean, next Saturday, July 9th, 29th at 9 a.m. Pacific. And our next book will read, our author is Olivia MacGyver with her book, Disruptive Kindness, which oh. is going to be a great experience on August 23rd, so in about a month from now. Again, thank you so much, both of you, for sharing your incredible experience, your work, your research. What a powerful, powerful global read we've had today. I'm truly, truly grateful for that. And thank you, everybody else that participated and had questions, because this was so meaningful. So thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, you so much. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for attending. Thank you. Mm -hmm.